Good morning and welcome to worship with First Congregational UCC in Asheville, North Carolina. We are, along with followers of Jesus across the globe, we are today celebrating World Communion Sunday. Often on World Communion Sunday, we celebrate the world's diverse cultures and music and materials and sometimes breads. Doing so reminds us that followers of Jesus across the globe share together in the sacrament of communion. Coming to the table is something we do together. The world has changed a lot since we celebrated World Communion Sunday last year. We've now lost one million people worldwide to COVID-19. Over one-fifth of those deaths have happened in our own country. Our country also has gotten a wake-up call on systemic racism. Many of our FCUCC members are working our way through Layla Saad's book, Me and White Supremacy. It's hard work for white folks waking up to our own participation in systemic racism is some of the hardest work we've ever done. Hard though the work might be, I am grateful that we as community are taking steps to do our part in dismantling racism. On this Worldwide Communion Sunday, we'll go to the table, as we always do, but this year we'll go in the context of what's happening in our world right now. What does the table mean in this time of COVID? What does the table mean in the context of systemic racism? We'll explore those questions as we worship today. If you haven't already gathered your elements, you might like to take a moment to do so. Just hit pause in just a minute. Any bread or libation will do. Anything becomes holy if we look for and find that of God in it. As we begin, let's take a moment to gather ourselves for worship. Relax where you are and breathe in God's love. Breathe out. God's love. We breathe in. Please join me in the call to worship. Come, the banquet of hope and praise is ready. Feed on the love of God in Jesus Christ. Be healed by God's gracious mercy. In Jesus' name, you are loved, healed, and forgiven.
Good morning, friends. Today is a special day in the life of the capital C Church, or in other words, the entire church. The church not just in our community, but the church around the world. So all the churches in the world. Today is World Communion Day. So you may remember that at the very beginning of every month, the first Sunday of every month, we celebrate communion together as a church community. Well, this Sunday is World Communion. And so um, all the churches around the world are celebrating communion together because we want to remember that we are together. We are one church united in this offering of communion. And so today I wanted to share with you some uh, two of my favorite communion sets that I have. This is one that a friend of mine made me who I used to work with. Her name is Miss Deborah, and she does a lot of pottery. And so she gave me this set. This is the chalice, and so we put our juice in this one. And here is what is called the patent. You might just call it a plate, though. It's the same thing. And then a very close friend of mine and my wife, Valerie, it had gave me a set whenever I was ordained in the Baptist church. And so I have that one I want to share with you too. This one's a very pretty set as well. There's the chalice and a much bigger pattern than the other one that I just showed you. And so, um, but I love being able to celebrate communion with our church family and um, we'll even make it more special to celebrate it with just my individual family as we all celebrate together in our individual homes. So I hope that you are able to celebrate communion, world communion, with your family today. All right, now take the hand of somebody who is sitting nearby, or if you're by yourself, you can give yourself a great big old hug as we pray together. God, thank you for giving us the sacrament of communion. Thank you for giving us the opportunity to celebrate World Communion Day with not only our church family, but with those around the world. It's in your son's name that we pray. Amen. For many years at the church I served in Metro Atlanta, I would on Martin Luther King Jr. weekend invite people to the table with these familiar words from King's I Have a Dream speech. He said, I have a dream that one day on the red hills of Georgia, the children of former slaves and the children of former slave owners will be able to sit together at the table. It's a sign of my white privilege that it took me years, years, to realize who I was in that equation. I am the descendant, a child, of slave owners. Anytime I come to the table in the beloved community, I always come as the descendant of slave owners. Since I woke up to my own family's history, I've been wrestling with what it means. How does my family's participation in the heinous crime of slaveholding 150 years ago shape who I am as a white woman trying to work for racial justice in 2020? <laughs> Oglethorpe County, Georgia, is where my family's from. From Barnettsburg, Sand Myers, and Yancey's, all of us have come. It's always made me proud to see the old home place, to know that I have roots there a rich heritage to embrace. On the highest point of the property, a weathered farmhouse stands. Front porch, screen door, banister, all hewn by human hands. Mantles in both downstairs rooms ornate and carved with skill, I touch the wood and wonder who 
whose artistry I feel. Who built this house? Who made this family strong? What is the legacy to which I belong? In a back room on a dusty shelf, I spot an age-stained book. Carefully I pull it down and take a curious look. I find within those pages an answer that dismays. In black and white I read it. This house was built by slaves. Who built this house? Who made this family strong? What is the legacy to which I belong? In the back of the ledger I find the dated will of my great 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 grandfather Thomas Yancey a long list of names I count them 44 and beside each one what he or she sell for. Who built this house? Who made this family strong? What is the legacy to which I belong? For all of us good white folk who have to reckon with our family's participation in the slave trade, there is a period of intense shame. How in the world could we be descended from people who thought they could enslave other people? Eventually, though, we get to a place where we recognize that we can't go back and undo what our ancestors have done. What we can do is reflect on what it means to be descended from people who understood themselves to be slave owners. And then, we must do whatever we can to transform the social and economic systems that made slavery possible. Because those social and economic systems are still at play in our world. The following piece by Elizabeth Alexander explains how. Reasons for the perpetuation of slavery. Reasons for the perpetuation of slavery is exactly what it sounds like. It's a list of reasons and rationalizations and temptations and justifications for this institution, a dark institution that's been with us as long as there have been humans. And it's with us today. And until we get our hands around it, until we figure it out and really decide to become vigilant, we're still going to have it. Reasons, reasons. Reasons, reasons. Reasons, 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 reasons for the perpetuation of slavery. 
this question had been on my mind for a long time. I didn't really like the idea that there were these bad people and good people. I don't really think the world works that way. And I wanted to understand what was actually underneath this institution in the past and why it was still in the present and why it was probably going to be in the future until we figured this out. So I sat down when I started composing this piece and I started listing everything I could think of, starting with the sheer possibility in the first place. It's as simple as when I discovered when I was about eight years old that I could tell my brother to go get me a drink, he was six, and he would just get up and do it. And I think that's where it starts, where we figure out that we can control another person in some way. The sheer possibility in the first When I was writing this piece, my high school sons happened to be taking a class in economics. So over the dinner table every night, we would talk about every human interaction as, as a manifestation of economics in our daily life. That opened my eyes to how slavery also was about economics, about how we're dealing with each other and whether we're dealing fairly or with our own self-interest in mind. It's easy to imagine that the slave owners and traders are the only perpetrators of slavery, and certainly they're the most culpable in a conscious way. But the more I've read, the more I've realized that slavery is a complicated economic issue. It is not advertised to us. It's not advertised to us that we're benefiting when we pull out our credit cards. In fact, the only clue that might be there that slavery is playing a part may be that we're encountering a surprisingly low price.
It's humbling to recognize that in seeking lower prices, in buying products from companies that do not adhere to rights for workers or who employ child labor, this great-great-great-granddaughter of slave owners still participates in social and economic systems that keep other people enslaved. Maybe that recognition is the key to the work of dismantling racism for great-great-great-granddaughters of slave owners. Recognizing that slavery is not only a practice of the past, but it's still at work in our world today. Southern author William Faulkner was right. The past is not dead. In fact, it's not even past. May God give us the courage to do the work that's needed to create a world of justice and joy for every person. May God give us strength to dismantle systems that oppress others. And may God's spirit infuse our imaginations with new plans and ideas so that we can create the world of which Martin dreamed. A world where everyone has a place at the table. In the name of our God, who creates us, redeems us, sustains us, and hopes for our wholeness. Amen.
A reading from Matthew. Then Jesus spoke to them again in parables. He said, The kingdom of heaven is like this. There was a ruler who prepared a feast for the wedding of the family's heir. But when the ruler sent out the workers to summon the invited guest, they wouldn't come. The ruler sent other workers, telling them to say to the guest, I have prepared this feast for you. My oxen and fattened cattle have been slaughtered, and everything is ready. Come to the wedding. But they took no notice. One went off to his farm, another to her business, and the rest seized the workers, attacked them, and brutally killed them. The ruler was furious and dispatched troops who destroyed those murderers and burned their town. Then the ruler said to the workers, The wedding feast is ready, but the guests I invited don't deserve the honor. Go out to the crossroads in the town and invite everyone you can find. The workers went out into the streets and collected everyone they met, good and bad alike, until the hall was filled with guests. If you respond to these words, then for you they have become the word of the still speaking God. In Middle Eastern cultures, to refuse someone's hospitality is offensive. I learned that lesson in 1992 at a preschool in the Jalazon refugee camp in Israel. Our Israeli bus driver dropped us off a few hundred yards away, and we swept into camp with a large group of children, joyous singing, coming home from school. The director of the preschool welcomed us with lemonade and cookies. I refused. Walking into the camp, I had seen just how little the refugees had. The fence, the barbed wire, the guard stations along the fencing. I was horrified. I mean, who was I to take their precious resources? But when I refused, the preschool director's expression let me know that I had insulted her. I drank the lemonade. I ate the cookie. The director smiled. When the initial invitees refuse the ruler's invitation to the table in today's scripture story, they insult the ruler. To refuse his generosity is to refuse him. And so the ruler dismisses them and sends his people out to find anybody and everybody and invite them to come to his table, invite them to the banquet. Matthew tells us the workers went out into the streets and collected everyone they met, good and bad alike, until the hall was filled with guests. When it comes to this table, hospitality, is the point. Jesus invited everyone to his table, which was a problem for some of the religious authorities. But Jesus didn't care. Jesus didn't care about rules that excluded people from the table. Jesus didn't care about rules that tried to exclude people from the community. Jesus didn't give a rip about religious rules that tried to convince people God didn't love them. What Jesus cared about was everybody understanding. Everybody in the world, everybody in every time, everybody ever born. What Jesus cared about was everybody understanding that they are welcome at the table. They are welcome in the community and they are deeply, deeply loved by God. And when we accept God's invitation to the table, when we allow ourselves to receive God's hospitality, like that Jalazon preschool director, I imagine God smiles. 
I also imagine God smiled when Jesus broke bread with his disciples the night before he died. When he broke the bread, blessed it, and gave it to his disciples and said, this is my body. It is broken for you. I also imagine God smiled when Jesus lifted the cup and said, this cup is the sign of a new covenant, a covenant of love. As often as you drink it, remember me. Let us pray. Holy One, some of us have not felt welcome at the table. Some of us who are gay, some of us who are divorced, some of us who happen to have beautiful black skin, some of us without permanent housing. Some of us have come to the table before and been sent away empty. Our prayer today is that even as we serve communion to ourselves, as we must in these days of the pandemic, our prayer today is that we are sitting at God's table. We are gathered with all God's children, good and bad alike, and that we are all deeply, deeply loved by God. As we partake today, help us to feel that love. Let us pray. Holy One, thank you for welcoming us to the table today. Now that we have been fed and nourished with your love, send us out to be your love in the world. Amen. If our brief look at economic systems has shown us anything this morning, it's that money has power. Our money has power. Even when we don't think we have very much. Where we spend our money, to whom we give it, the financial gifts we give empower others. The money we give acts other people into well-being. Our offerings make a difference in the world. And so as an act of worship, as an act of joy, as an act of empowerment, we all are invited to give as we are able. architect of creation. Thank you for the gift of your spirit that is implanted in each of our hearts. Help us to recognize you both in ourselves and in our neighbors. Receive these offerings given in a spirit of gratitude and guide us in their use so that we might bring wholeness to ourselves and to each other. 
for in serving one another, we serve you. I invite you to join in making music as part of worship. You're welcome to sing. You may also choose to add body percussion to the song. Here are a few patterns you might try. The steady beat. The brush hands part is a little bit more of a challenge. It goes like this. You might get your feet into the rhythm to sound like this one. If you want an extra challenge, the snap and pat would sound like this. Okay, let's put them together with some singing. Let's start with the steady beat. And it goes one, two, ready. Ready and sing. Let us talents and tongues employ, reaching out with a shout of joy. Bread is broken, the wine is poured. Christ is spoken and seen and heard. Jesus lives again, earth can breathe again. Pass the word around, loaves abound. Jesus lives again, earth can breathe again, pass the word around, loaves abound. Christ is able to make us one, at the table he set the tone, teaching people to live to bless, love in word and in deed express. Jesus lives again, earth can breathe again, pass the word around, loaves abound. Jesus lives again, earth can breathe again, pass the word around, loaves abound. Jesus calls us in, sends us out, bearing fruit in a world of doubt gives us love to tell bread to share god emmanuel everywhere jesus lives again earth can breathe again pass the word around loaves abound jesus lives again earth can breathe again pass the word around loaves abound jesus lives again earth can breathe again. Pass the word around. Loaves abound. Let us go from this place and share the good news that everyone, everyone has a place at this table. Amen.